Greetings and salutations. This is Dave Duford at Final Expense Agent Mentor, where I help agents like you succeed in the insurance business. And today I have the pleasure of uh, interviewing Mr. Nick Frumpkin. Uh, say hello to everybody, Nick. Hey there. A little bit about Nick. Uh, Nick has been selling uh, Final Expense exclusively for the past three years, so approximately since 2015. Uh, and as of last year in 2017, uh, Nick sold a total of $287,000 in final expense business exclusively. This is the reason I'm having Nick on here because uh, he's uh, an excellent top uh, 5%, if not top 2% agent. He's got a lot of good experience that's practical. And in today's interview, what we're really gonna be spending the most time doing is really talking about tactics, uh, what Nick does to get into the home, what he does to actually sell the final expense product, dealing with objections and that kind of thing. So if you're looking for uh, a, an interview that's more geared around training and actually doing implementation uh, to improve your uh, effort uh, in front of your prospects, this will be uh, the interview to listen to. So again, Nick, welcome and thank you so much for joining. Oh, thanks for having me, Dave. Thanks. Yeah. So let's go ahead and start from the top. So tell us a little bit about your background and uh, how did you get involved in actually selling insurance in the first place? Um, long story short, uh, I... I was not in the insurance field uh, until about five years ago at all. Um, I was working as a teacher. Um, my wife and I, for a variety of reasons, decided we needed to make some changes uh, in our life, and we moved to a different state. Um, and when we moved to a different state, uh, I decided that I was not actually as fond of teaching as I thought I was going to be when I got into it and wanted to try and do something a little different. Um, didn't really know what sort of skills I had. Um, my father uh, is a financial planner. He deals mostly with um, annuities, uh, 403Bs and things like that. And so I've had a little bit of exposure to that kind of life. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll see what's going on. Um, put out some feelers, got hired by Combined Insurance, um, which at the, at the time felt like a really big deal. And I realize now that they'll hire anybody. But... Um, but uh, they were a really good uh, training ground. Um, and so um, I learned to sell to the lower to middle income market there and um, have ended up kind of transitioning into final expense through a series of misadventures. Yeah, why, why don't you, you know, I always find it interesting talking to final expense agents because it's not necessarily the first thing a lot of agents get into. They kind of hear about it or they, you know, they stumble across it. It certainly isn't the first uh, line of business on many people's minds to get involved in. I'm, I'm kind of curious, how did you end up in final expense? How did you find out about it? Um, so I, I was doing pretty well at Combined Insurance. I'd met a bunch of people that uh, worked there and had gone on to do other things. Um, I, after spending a couple of years there, I started getting some phone calls from people trying to recruit me to do other stuff. Um, and one day I got a phone call from a guy who was actually a friend of mine saying, Hey, I've started doing this new thing. Um, and he was always doing a new thing, but this time it actually sounded like it was pretty interesting. He said, I'm doing this thing. I'm, I'm selling uh, final expense life insurance. Um, we're selling to the exact same clientele that you're already working with it combined. It's just, they're older. You know, so instead of selling to these people when they're 30 to 50, you're selling them when they're 50 to 70. Um, and the, the big deal is, uh, you know, we, instead of making, you know, like a 35% on a life insurance sale, you're making, you know, 80%. Um, and I was like, wow, 80%, my God, that's, that's amazing. Um, so I said, I, I'll, I'll at least come out and check out what's going on with that. Uh, and he took me on a ride along and it did in fact seem exactly like what I'd been doing for combined, um, except he had leads, which we weren't allowed to use at combined. Um, and, uh, fortunately, I suppose after talking to his boss, I decided I didn't particularly like his boss, um, or trust his boss and that I should maybe take the idea and see if there was somebody else out there that was doing it. Uh, and I did some Googling and I found the insurance forms. And um, when I found the insurance forms, I realized that 80% was maybe not the best contract that I could get. 
uh, and talked to a whole bunch of different IMOs. Uh, ended up talking to Scott Burke at um, FEX Contracting. Um, and had a really nice long conversation with him where he convinced me that they were um, a place that would treat me fairly and honestly uh, and would be a place where I could kind of learn how to do this. Uh, and so that's, that's sort of how I ended up here. And my dog is in the background desperately trying to, to play with me. So if, <laughs> hey, it's a, that's okay. No big deal. Uh, be a little entertaining for the audience, I'm sure. So, so let's, now that we know kind of how you got into final expense, let's, um, let's discuss what kind of uh, you know, day to day, week to week kind of look is at your schedule. If you could kind of go over more or less, um, you know, when do you start setting your appointments? When do you actually run your appointments? How much are you actually uh, working to set up appointments and seeing people in the field in, in any given week? Sure. Um, I, I guess it should start with my leads. Um, I am on a lead program where I actually have a set price lead and I get 25 of those a week. Um, I get those leads in every week on Friday uh, and put them into my CRM system. I set appointments almost exclusively. I'll, I'll door knock if I need to, but I don't very much anymore. Um, I start calling people at 9 a.m. on Saturday. Uh, with a goal of setting for Monday a minimum of eight appointments, um, a maximum of like 11. Uh, if I try to set 12, things actually tend to go very badly for my days. But um, a minimum of eight appointments, and usually I set like nine or 10 uh, for Monday. Um, takes me until from 9.30 on average to like 10.30 in the morning, so about an hour and a half. Um, calling people, uh, calling the fresh leads. Um, my goal on Mondays is to give uh, 10, uh, 10 presentations if possible. Um, it's a high bar. It's not always possible, or it's not always even close to possible. But that's sort of the mark that I've set for myself um, so that I know that by the time I leave the field on Monday, I have done everything necessary to put myself in a position where the rest of my week, I don't need to work as hard. Uh, I can just sort of let the rest of the week kind of take care of itself. Um, so that's, that's sort of what I do. So, you know, let's, let's start with the couple things that are interesting to kind of dive into. So with you call on Saturday, to yes. set appointments you, you, and you said earlier that you don't, door knock do you, do you feel that appointment setting is superior to door knocking and why do you do that versus just taking the leads and going out on monday morning at nine and just knocking doors to get the presentations i don't feel like it's necessarily empirically superior than door knocking um but i do feel that for me it is definitely superior to door knocking um it, i have a higher comfort level when I'm in somebody's house, if I know that I've spoken to them before and they've said, yeah, it's okay, come on over. Um, then I do when I'm just barging in. Um, I have a lot of experience going into people's houses just completely cold. Um, part of the reason I brought up combined, that's their whole model is you don't get leads, you don't talk to people in advance, they drop you off in the middle of a town and you go sell stuff. Um, uh, and uh, it's a hard way to work and it's tiring. <laughs> um, and I do really feel like I want to push to try and get as many of those presentations accomplished on Monday as I possibly, possibly can, because I, I'm lazy and I don't want to work very hard the rest of the week. And I, I would like to work uh, really hard one day and work less hard the rest of the week. Um, so uh, for me, setting appointments is about efficiency more than anything else. Um, and my own personal comfort level. So I, I'm kind of curious in, in your experience. One of the things that I think people who set, and I'm totally on board with everything you're saying personally, that's how I prefer to run final expense leads. But the one thing I've noticed, I'm curious your perspective, is that there is a level of difficulty, it seems, in getting some of these leads to actually pick the phone up. Uh, sometimes it's one out of four leads, you can call them a million times and they'll just never pick the phone up. And the only way to see them is the door knock. And what, what are your experiences as far as how many you actually setting as a percentage 
uh, as, as appointments and, and, and that kind of difficulty with getting people to pick up. Yeah, sometimes it is hard to get people to pick up. Um, I, I have a theory that um, different cities and towns have different personalities um, and that the culture of different places where you work um, can kind of be tracked uh, pretty clearly. There are places where if you drop leads there, nobody is ever going to answer the phone no matter what you do. And there are places if you drop leads there, everybody's going to answer the phone, but nobody's going to show up to their appointments. Um, you know, and there are places that are in between. Um, I have over the last couple of years tried to just eliminate the places that, um, I just never get anybody answering the phone. So that's step one for me. Um, as far as the number of people that I actually contact though, um, I mean, I will usually run off of my 25 leads. I'll usually run 15 to 18 appointments every week. Um, so I'm getting appointments set with a good number of people. Um, I never really thought about the numbers that I'm not reaching. I do, I do door knock if I have time. Like if I'm out in the field and I've been stood up by somebody or, you know, I have a couple of back to back really quick, either closes or no sales. Um, I'll go out and fill that time. I'm not just sitting around in my car reading a book or something, but, um, but I don't have as much difficulty with the people just refusing to answer the phone as I feel like other people seem to. I don't know if it's because I'm more persistent about just continuing to call. Um, I have no problem calling people from the same phone number eight, nine, 10 times in a single day. Um, a lot of times I set appointments after I'm done setting appointments where people call back and they're saying, hey, you called me five times today, what's going on? Right. Um, so that happens too. Um, I feel like a lot of new agents when they get into this uh, have a feeling of, they get easily discouraged by small samples. They, right. they have something bad happen to them four or five times. Um, you know, they'll have two or three days where they have a rough call day and it just happens to happen at the beginning of their career. And I mean, those happen to everybody. Um, and they decide, ah, this is not for me. This never works. I don't know how anybody can do this. Um, I, not just from my own personal experience, but the people that mentor me and that I've worked with and talked with, um, there's a long track record out there that, you know, if you sit down and you make the calls and you put in the time that setting appointments does work. Um, and at the end of the day is significantly more efficient. Um, I really do. I spend maybe a total of two hours a week setting appointments, like tops on a bad week. Do you think, do you think that calling Saturday mornings gives you a slight edge? In how many I do. people that you're reaching? Yeah. I think Saturday mornings is the best day to call. Um, you know, I call 9am Saturday, um, every week. Uh, it is, there is very little that will keep me from getting on the phone at nine o'clock in the morning on Saturday. Um, but I mean, if you've got fresh leads, I, I know guys that call Monday and Wednesday and set appointments for Tuesday and Thursday right. and are having no problems. Um, I know people that call Sunday night. There are some people that say, you know, forget it. Saturday mornings is not happening for me, but right. they sit down at four or five o'clock on a Sunday and call, and they also have no problems. So, um, you know, for me, I, Saturdays is the best time. But so when you actually get these people on the phone and mm -hmm. you're in the process of setting appointments, you know, a lot in the final expense community, there's people who will say, "Well, you just call to set the appointment, and you're if you sell anything, it's selling the appointment. It's not selling the product." Or some people do some kind of qualification on the phone. What's your approach when you set an appointment? Um, I don't want to qualify at all. Um, the less I know, the happier I am. Uh, I don't know what the people who do a lot of qualifying on the phone talk about in their appointments. Um, I, I would love to sit down and talk to one of them someday and find out actually how their appointments go because I don't understand what they talk about. Um, that's all my appointment is, is qualifying. Um, but 
uh, I sit down and it's very simply just, hey, I'm the guy you sent this card into. I'm going to be in your neighborhood Monday at 10 o'clock. Are you going to be home? Um, and that's, I mean, there's a little bit more to it than that, but not a whole heck of a lot. Um, I'll verify their address, but that's, that's pretty much it. I don't want to know anymore. Yeah, right. I, and yeah, that's, I think the easiest way to set appointments and it works well. It's just like, you know, we talk about the direct mail program, which we'll get to, you know, a lot of agents think they should do some other kind of leads, but why when direct mail is proven to work and multitude of markets, less like yours, like other agents as well. Um, so uh, what kind of objections do you hear when you're calling on the phone to set appointments? What do you think the most common one is and how do you handle it? Um, the most common one is one that doesn't get talked about a lot, but uh, the most common one is actually, uh, I didn't send that. I, I, that, that wasn't me. Um, That's my signature, but that, I didn't send it. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't me. I didn't do that. Um, I, uh, usually if I slow down and I'll just read the card to them, I find a lot of people knee jerk and think that you are calling about something completely different. Um, they don't even listen to you for the first couple of sentences that you're saying. Um, to me, that's an indication that I'm speaking too fast, which is a tendency that I have, especially on the phone to talk too fast. Um, so they're not hearing me. So if I can keep them from just saying, I didn't send that click. Um, and just stop and say, well, this is, I think something different. You do, I do have this card in front of me. Um, this is what the card says and read the card back. And, um, and then, you know, if all else fails, essentially say, well, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm going to be in your neighborhood anyway. I'm still the guy that's supposed to get this to you. Are you going to be home on this day? I'll show you the card when I come by. Cause I promise you, I have it. You did this. This was something you wanted. Um, the other objection that I get a lot also is, oh, I've already taken care of that. Um, or I already have something. I already did that. You're too late. Um, which is actually a good one. Those are people that you want to see. Um, so frequently that's as simple as, oh, that's great. You know, uh, we all, you know, um, so yeah, let's actually go into it, I guess. Uh, you know, that's great. That's not a problem. You know, most of the people that send this card in do already have something taken care of. That's not really why I'm calling. Um, I'm calling because I'm the person who's supposed to deliver this information you requested to you. And I'm going to be by on Monday. And I just need to make sure you're going to be home. Um, will you be home at 10 o'clock when I come by? Um, like 90% of the time, that's enough. You know, just being, you know, it's not a big deal. Sometimes you can go into other stuff, but uh, most of the time you don't really need to do anything more than just say, I'm coming by anyway. It doesn't matter to me. So you're not, so when you hear that I've got insurance, you're not saying who do you got it with? How much no, no. you got? What's the price? No, no. Cause that'll scare them off. Um, you know, you don't, I, and I, if somebody tells me they have insurance, those are people that I want to talk to. Um, they, they have proven that they are interested in insurance and they have proven that they can pay for and keep up with their insurance policy. Um, that's definitely someone I want to talk to. Yeah, pro tip for uh, you uh, new guys out there. Whenever you hear that, you know, the old saying is, is the best person to sell policy to is the one that's already paying the premium. And, uh, you know, many times you can improve their lot with the insurance that they have. So don't get discouraged. Uh, do exactly what Nick says and just see them anyway. And uh, you'll be surprised how much more business is right. So um, let, next question, let's talk about leads. So you mentioned uh, you do a fixed price lead program um, specifically. Why do you work them versus other kind of lead sources? And um, what would your comments be kind of after that to agents that prefer to use something else or want to use some other kind of non-direct mail lead card as it relates to their longer term career aspirations? Um, I've used a lot of different types of leads um, over, over time. Um, I've used a lot of different telemarketers. I experimented with using Facebook leads. Um, I've done a bunch of stuff. Uh, the only lead source that I've worked that has been as consistent in terms of uh, the quality of prospects that it delivers um, and the number of leads that they deliver are direct mail. Um, and at the end of the day, 
even if you're paying, I'm, I'm paying less than this, but even if you're paying like 32 or $33 a lead, um, $35 a lead, leads are cheap. Um, you know, in comparison to the return that you're making on those leads, you know, if you're going out and writing $4,000 a week, um, let's say you're only on a hundred percent contract, you could probably do better than that, but a lot of people aren't. Um, you know, you're making $4,000 a week and you're spending 600 on that. I mean, uh, the return is just like silly to not get the best quality lead that you can possibly get. Um, at a certain point you have to bet on yourself and believe that you actually can do that. Um, but while there are other lead sources that will temporarily be good, I like telemarketed leads as like a fill in lead. If something happens and you know, I'm paying price per lead. So it's not a big deal if I don't get all my leads in cause I'm not paying for it. But every now and then it happens where I get five leads. That's not my favorite thing, but it happens. Um, telemarketed leads are good to kind of fill in there. Um, they're inexpensive, they come fast, but, uh, anybody that's worked a lot of telemarketed leads can tell you two things. They burn out fast. You can't call the same area very often. So you start having to expand your area and pretty soon you're working your entire state. I live in Pennsylvania. That's a large, large area to work. Um, and, uh, you get a lot of people who aren't actually interested. Uh, you get a lot of people who just say yes to get the telemarketer off the phone. You get a lot of people who don't know what they're talking about and are suffering from dementia and uh, other types of psychological disorders. And you get a lot of people who are deathly, deathly ill. Um, you don't get those with the direct mail. And as far as I can tell, you don't have to worry so much about area burnout. Um, I've been working the same area now for three plus years and um, I mean, the returns are the same today as they were when I started um, and I get some repeats but not nearly as many repeats as even some of the people that I hear complain about so mm. yeah and, and, and same thing for you guys that are new it's it, it's interesting because <clears throat> especially with more the more time an agent's been in the final expense business me I can relate exactly what Nick's saying is you'll find the uh, how do you say the interest in trying to find something else to potentially substitute a direct mail lead or see if there's something better. But many times it's, it's funny. I've been doing this since 2011 and the way I generate leads is exactly the same today as it was when I started in 2011, when I was just told to buy direct mail, I didn't have the, uh, the forethought to think otherwise at the point I was just doing what I was told. So it's kind of funny how you kind of go back to basics you know, after uh, experimenting with other things. And yes, they, I agree too, that there's definitely a place to have those as, as fill-ins. But again, you know, Nick, the people he works with, like Travis, these guys have been doing final expense for ages and there's no sex appeal in this business. They're just doing the same old thing. It's all direct mail. I mean, you know. Yeah, well, and it is. It's, um, and it's funny, you mentioned, you know, you were just doing what you were told. Um, and I find that the guys that are most successful when they're starting off are the ones that just, they don't know any better and they just do what they're told to do. There's a lot of guys that have been doing this for a long time that have this business figured out, um, that have been very successful. Um, there is, uh, there's a couple of guys on Facebook who I, who I see sometimes say that, you know, Everybody says, don't try and reinvent the wheel, but those people aren't trying. And I think to myself, man, you guys are working too hard. Um, it's a good business. You, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. This business already works the way that it is. It's so easy. It's complicated. I mean, I, I can tell yeah. a test to it. There's, if you have a creative element to you, you've got to find another way to find another outlet for it because you'll start going in and tweaking this business. And it's, and again, it's, it's what's so weird about this business. It's already been figured out. I mean, all you hear about in the news today is how technology is interrupting absolutely everything and Amazon's destroying the, the basic retail model and insurance is, is dramatically changing. We're doing the same thing these guys are doing in the 70s and 80s with practically the same kind of lead card. I mean, it's, it sounds crazy, but that's really how it is. And I don't think it's going to really change that much either. I don't, I don't either. It doesn't look like it's going to change. Um, 
you know the the biggest change that i've seen um i mean again i've only been working with final expense for three years i've been doing other stuff for a couple of years longer than that more or less the same market just younger people um is the rise of cell phones and texting like my clients my clients would rather text me now um than call me that's pretty much it like you know and i talk to other guys um a lot and i try hard to talk to as many people as i can i'm a big believer in surrounding yourself with smart people who are better at things than you are um and it seems to be the same for everybody else there's not that much that's changing um you know i tried using some of these facebook leads that have gotten really popular and they're fine um they're more expensive than a telemarketed lead and they seem to be about the same quality. Um, they don't, for me, bring in any different type of prospect. Um, they're okay. I mean, but they're not as good as direct mail. Um, so when, well, if we go back and look at direct mail, uh, obviously another, another rage, <coughs> excuse me, another raging debate that you'll get into with agents is whether or not the lead should say life insurance on it. I'm curious, what, what's your thoughts on that? What do you use as far as, a, as the lead goes? Does it say life insurance? Is it not? Where do you stand on that? Uh, okay. Um, I think for most new agents, you probably, if, gosh, my feelings about this are somewhat complicated. I use a lead that says life insurance. I use a lead that says life insurance primarily, though, because in the area where I'm working and the way the lead house that I work with sends out leads, I get too many leads if I do not put a, if I do not put life insurance on my lead. I get so many returns that by the time I get to, I'm, I, I end up starting to work leads that were returned in like September in when I'm now in January. Um, and it causes problems. So I needed a way to kind of, cut back on the lead flow, especially if you're dropping price per thousand. And there are some really good lead houses that do drop price per thousand. Um, I would recommend a lead that does not say life insurance on it because you want to get your returns as high as possible. If you're dropping, um, if you're, if you're getting a fixed price lead and you don't care that you're working maybe three or four month old leads and some people don't, um, don't say life insurance. You'll get way more leads. Um, there are people who tell me that you will get fewer people who already have life insurance if your leads say life insurance on them. Um, I ran, I ran the lead connection E64 lead for two years. Um, I've been running one and a half years. I've been running the, the lead that I've got for about one and a half years. Um, and I started with it not saying life insurance. I've been having life insurance on my lead for a full year at this point. I have not noticed any difference in whether or not people have life insurance already. Um, my replacement percentage hasn't changed at all. Um, and uh, I, I honestly can't tell the difference. Um, the number of people who think it's not about life insurance hasn't changed either. Everybody still says, I didn't know this was life insurance. It doesn't matter that it says life insurance on it. Um, but you'll get fewer leads back. And so sometimes for me, that's a good thing. So, so it sounds like if, if, if part of the reason you, you do the life insurance leads is just to make sure your leads stay fresher, right? When, by the time you get them. Yeah. Um, and there are many people who will tell you that it does not matter at all. Um, I personally have noticed that um, the lead gets a little bit harder to work when it starts to get to be about three or four months old, even if you've never contacted them. Um, I don't think it matters so much that you can't sell them, but it matters a little bit. And, um, you know, it also the lead house that I'm using starts to get really mad at me. If I end up with a backlog of like a thousand leads that I haven't paid for yet, they don't like that. <laughs> and, um, you, you uh, really haven't that, that much in backlog. Wow. <laughs> well, uh, not, not anymore, but yeah, <laughs> at one point, yeah, they shut off dropping fresh leads for me because they were like, you've got too many that we, you haven't, that you haven't paid wow. for um, it was a, it was a problem. Um, but best problem to have too many. Damn I know. Pieces. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, there, I, I hit one area that is just like everybody and their brother wants life insurance and sends back life insurance. 
stress relief center. It's actually not a great area to sell in, but man, you get crazy returns. Um, uh, so anyway, yeah. Cool. Okay, so let's let's jump into your actual uh, sales presentation. I, I'm sure my audience is kind of interested to hear what you do. So let's talk about uh, rapport building. You know, some guys they do a lot of talking, they do very little. I'm curious to see uh, what you do, and then the second part to that question is 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 we kind of, I don't know, we may have talked about on camera we may not have off camera I, I can't remember but you do sell a little bit of other product besides final expense as it presents itself so I'm curious is your presentation laser focused on final expense or are you doing more of a generic fact finder to collect these other business these other business cross sell opportunities uh, take it away and tell us um, yeah so as far as warm ups go. Uh, I am a big believer in um, the idea that most of the people we're sitting with don't have that long of an attention span and that you've only got a couple of minutes to really kind of grab them. Uh, I don't think you should go in there and be rude. You know, you shouldn't go in there and, and not say things like, hello, how are you? Um, but that's kind of the extent of my warm up. If there is something that I genuinely see in their house that is cool. I saw a guy the other day who, uh, his hobby is building model airplanes and he had this like five foot long, uh, model airplane that he had built, uh, that was just awesome. And we talked about that for a couple minutes. Um, but the reality is most of the people, in my opinion, do not care who I am or um, what I'm there about other than to have the meeting. Um, my whole purpose when I am in their house is to be as professional and efficient as possible. Um, also, you have to remember, I, I mean, I try to give 10 presentations a day. If I'm in each presentation for more than an hour, I am in trouble. Um, but, uh, I feel that a lot of times people appreciate, you know, being very direct and very straightforward, not being salesy, um, just coming in and saying, hey, how you doing? I'm Nick. We talked on the phone the other day. Um, I'm here to talk about the final expense programs. Do you mind if we sit at your table over there? We we'll Go sit down and pretty much just go into it. You know, hey, I'm, I'm here. You sent this card back, the whole thing. So are you um, jumping into a, a strict final expense presentation or are you, are you collecting facts along the way of potentially other cross-sell opportunities? I am, I do do some cross-selling. Um, I do some cross-selling in a couple of different ways and I, I feel like it's pretty subtle um, how I collect that information. My presentation is a final expense presentation. The one thing I do is when I introduce myself, and I say who I am and what I do. Um, I, I say, in addition to final expense, my company does help seniors with other senior benefits. We do things like Medicare and help people with retirement plannings and whatnot. That's not what I'm here to talk to you about today, and we're not going to talk about that. But if in the future you'd like to talk to me about something like that, we can do that. Um, and then I go into my regular final expense presentation. I also as part of my health fact finding, when I'm asking people about their health, I ask people what they use for their health insurance. Um, I find that's kind of a natural place to put that in there, just to, again, kind of get an idea of whether or not there's even a reason to be talking to them about anything else. Um, if I'm not talking to people about, so I, I look a little bit for Medicare stuff that way. Um, Anything else that I sell above and beyond that is either going to be based on the fact find that I do during the f final expense presentation. They've got a universal life policy that has $20,000 in cash value in it. Well, okay, I'll, I'll talk to them about some things that they can do with that cash value. Um, I don't recommend that if you do not know how to do that already, that you do anything other than offer for them to get the cash value back. Um, but I do have a background in doing some stuff like that. And so I, you know, I can recommend some good single premium products. I can recommend an annuity. We can have a conversation. Um, my presentation is very much built around the idea that, um, this is a conversation that I'm having. 
there are very strict points that I'm hitting. Um, there are very specific marks that I hit. Um, but there is room in the presentation that I use to have them ask, ask me questions, um, for me to ask them questions and kind of establish a little bit of rapport as we go along that way and um, find out if there is actually genuinely anything that they need. Um, the last thing that I do after that is before I leave everybody's house, um, I, if for some reason the Medicare stuff hasn't come up, um, I will say to them, you know, just as a reminder, you know, we do help people with Medicare. Um, anytime, if you ever want to talk to somebody about that, when you see the commercials come on TV reminding you about Medicare and you think, oh, hey, I should do that, you know, pull my card out, give me a call. I work with all those same companies also. I'm more than happy to sit down and talk to you about anything like that. Um, and I get, a, I get calls from that, um, not infrequently. Um, when I was with Combined, uh, I spent most of my time there um, in their Medicare department. Um, I didn't start off there, but that's where I ended up and that's where I spent most of my time. So I'm, I came into final expense, very, very familiar with Medicare. Um, and because of, uh, having worked for my father as a teenager and then uh, a whole bunch of other reasons, um, I have a decent understanding of how things like single premium, whole life insurance work, annuities, that sort of stuff. I've, I've got a better grasp on that than, um, your average Joe. Uh, so those are things that I'm very comfortable talking about. Um, I strongly recommend for new agents, though, if you do not have that background and you do not have that comfort level, um, the best thing to do is to just focus on one thing. Get good at selling final expense. You know, start selling $200,000 of final expense a year and then learn how to do something else if you even want to. Um, You know, for me, it's not any extra work. It's not anything that I have to learn. It's not anything that I have to get up on because it's something I've been doing for longer than I've been doing this. Um, but all of that said, 85% of my business is still just purely final expense. Um, I, I like doing Medicare stuff. Um, I get a lot of referrals for Medicare stuff. Uh, but Medicare is not my line. Uh, Medicare is just something that I go to if I happen to stumble across it. Same thing with single premium and all the rest. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned uh, the, the new guy in mind because as soon as an agent new gets out there, many times they find there's all sorts of other sales opportunities and, and on some level feel like they're losing out on business. But I find that, you know, diffusion is the enemy of productivity, especially mm -hmm. as you're a new agent, you're going to find that, it's, it's enough to know five, 10 different insurance companies as it relates to final expense and underwriting and understanding the final expense market. You really don't need to throw a whole new problem on your back, at least like you said, until you've actually proven that you can write substantial business and, 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 and do well. And like you said, you may not even care if you're writing that much business because if you are, you're probably doing pretty well as it stands. But yeah, it's one step at a time. I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah. Um, and I feel like the biggest stumbling block I see for new agents when they come on is they try to do everything. Um, and I mean, and this is something that goes back to my dad. When I first told him I was looking at getting into the insurance industry, um, you know, he said he's, he's a specialist. He works just with teachers. You know, he does retirement planning for public school teachers. That's it. Uh, and he said, the best advice he ever gave me was uh, the people who I have known in this business who have been long-term successful are all people who have picked one niche and just focused on that and nothing else. Um, the people that I see that never succeed that are always just kind of limping along are the guys that try and do a little bit of everything. Um, so, I mean, to that end, you know, I do do some other stuff, but everything I do, I feel is in complement to the final expense. Um, I never take my focus off the fact that what I do is sell final expense. Um, I don't take off for AEP. Um, I don't stop selling uh, final expense at any point during the year. Um, and if 
I start feeling like one thing is taking me too far out of my final expense lane. I drop it. Um, it's taking up too much of my time. So, uh, uh, you know, it's interesting. You, you, you know, John Duggar, uh, John Duggar has been in the business a long time. Uh, he's part of the reason uh, I got into this business when I was in uh, the same position you were in back in 2011 doing research on final expense. I came across his post on the insurance forum and, and he was a, a mode of inspiration for myself. And, I've always kept up with John. And interestingly enough, um, now just for you guys that have never heard of John, John Duggar is a guy, he's been in the business at least 10 years, if not longer. Uh, he's written 200,000 a year, first off of 15 leads. He's working down to 10 leads now, and he, he writes 200 grand. I mean, he's just a, he's a powerhouse and uh, certainly full of a lot of different perspectives on this business. And the one thing that he does that I find interesting that very few others do, and I'd like your kind of perspective on this, is that several years back, he moved to actually delivering policies as opposed to having the insurance companies do so. And his rationale was he just found that he stumbled across more referrals that way. Well, I don't know if it necessarily stumbled, but it gave him another opportunity for these people to say, hey, uh, you know, go see my sister down the street. She needs life insurance. And I'm kind of curious because you, in a sense, you run your business very similar to how John does the, you know, the call next day appointments, that kind of approach, like how Travis does as well. So is that something you do or do you have the insurance carriers deliver the policies and, and why do you do it either way? Uh, yeah, uh, and, and I am fortunate to be able to call uh, John a good friend of mine um, and he's been extraordinarily helpful um, along with Travis um, to uh, get me to where I am. Um, and, I do deliver a lot of my policies, although not for the same reason that JD does. Um, he is a much more organized person than I am. Um, and in many ways, a much more focused person than I am. Uh, I am somewhat envious of how organized and focused he is. Um, I, I, I have told him this. I, I hope that when I grow up, I can be like him. But... Um, I, in Pennsylvania, um, my main carrier is uh, KSKJ, um, with my secondary carrier being family benefit. Um, sometimes those slip flop, depends on how I feel. Um, family benefit um, has wacky rules about delivery. Um, and so I do not deliver any of their policies. In Pennsylvania, KSKJ requires that agents deliver all their policies. So I don't have the choice. Um, I think we're the only state in the country where they actually require that. Um, it, and it's frustrating. And um, But because I do write a lot of business with them, uh, I have gotten into the habit of delivering and I'll say you're not wrong. Uh, I mean, I don't know that that's the reason why JD delivers. Um, I think if you asked him, he probably would tell you that it's not, but, um, you do get a lot of opportunities for additional business and referrals, uh, when you go deliver. Um, I also, and again, I don't know if this has to do with my delivering or not, but my persistency is much higher than industry average. Um, if people make their first month's payment, uh, that's kind of where my problem is. Not everybody makes their first month's payment. But, um, but if people make their first month's payment, I keep like 92 or 93% of them on the books um, after month 13. Um, which, I mean, there's a lot of agents that would be happy to be getting, you know, 80% persistency for 13 months. Um, some of that probably is because I deliver a lot of policies. Um, I don't deliver them all. Sometimes I end up running out of time and I end up sticking them in the mail and with a little note saying, Hey, I hope you send this delivery receipt back into the company. They'd really appreciate it. Um, but I think there is a value there if you can be disciplined and organized enough with your time that you go and deliver policies yourself. Um, I don't remember uh, where I read this, um, but uh, one of the sales books that I was reading when I very first got into the business, and 
I'm a nerd. I, I, I do that sort of thing. I, I've read dozens of sales books to the point where I, I literally don't remember who said what anymore. But um, the, the concept of high touch selling being uh, better than, um, you know, just one and done, get them in, get them out, um, where you do develop that relationship. Um, now, the way that I structure my business model, I don't want to. Hey, there you go. <laughs> Yeah, the way that I structure my business model, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that initial appointment, but I do want my clients to feel like, yeah, that is, um, that is a person that is the guy, that's the guy that I'm going to. When I have a problem, I'm calling him. Uh, when something goes wrong, uh, I'm calling him. When my kids have a problem, I'm calling him. Um, and I feel like doing things like delivering policies, helping them change their bank uh, bank account information when their bank account information updates, when they want to make a beneficiary change, I go out and I see them. Um, and, and that is a lot of stuff that I learned from, from, from John, from JD, um, that they're just good ways to keep yourself in front of your client. Um, and I feel is more important in terms of the rapport building and the relationship building than any kind of long extended warm up that you would have at the beginning of your presentation. Um, and develops a genuine relationship. So as we kind of uh, uh, warm down our uh, our interview, it's been excellent so far. I appreciate it, Nick. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to ask the guys that do well in this business. You know, I know you've probably, like me, have seen many agents come and go, and uh, it's interesting because, like we said earlier, this business is fairly boring. I mean, there's no secrets here. It's just do what you're told and implement. I'm right. kind of curious to hear, because I know you help a lot of guys and interact a lot with different agents. Why do you think most agents fail out of this business and what can they do about it to actually succeed? It is a deceptively difficult business because it is so easy. Um, or it's so simple, I suppose. It's not really, it's not really easy, but it's, it's very simple. There's not a lot of work that you actually have to do. Um, you don't have to come up with anything yourself. You don't need to mess around with fancy sales techniques. You just need to go out and see the people buy the leads, set the appointments or knock the doors. If you're more comfortable knocking doors, but give the presentations, um, you know, you talk to a lot of agents that are struggling and you ask them, you know, how many presentations are you given a week? And I'll say, Oh, I don't know, five or six. Well, that's not enough. Um, you talk to them and you ask them, Hey, are you recording your presentations? Well, I don't really want to record a presentation. I don't know how I feel about having a recorder out on the kitchen table while I'm talking to the people. Um, the best thing you can do for yourself is to record every presentation that you give and then don't just record it, you know, listen to it. Um, critique yourself, send it to somebody that you trust to listen to it. Um, give yourself feedback you are probably saying things that you do not intend to say um, in your presentation. Um, but a lot of agents don't do that. A lot of agents don't want to commit to a system. It almost doesn't matter what your system is. Um, it's got to be a system that works, but there's a lot of systems that work. Uh, but you got to pick one and you got to stick to it. Um, and you got to, and this is true for any line of insurance, um, you got to sell out to the line that you're selling. You know, if what you're doing is, is selling Medicare and what you really want to do is be a Medicare agent, you got to sell out and just sell Medicare. Same is true if you're looking to sell financial planning and annuities. Sell out, just do that. Don't try and mess with other stuff. It's no different in final expense. Um, it's a high volume business. You know, I wrote 400 policies ish last year. You know, you, you write a lot. Um, you cannot write in volume if you're trying to do everything. Um, pick a thing, pick a path, have a way, um, go down that path, uh, stick to it and give it a fair shake. You know, give yourself the hours um, of actually blindly following the path before you decide that that path doesn't work. Um, because if 
There are agents out there that are writing $200,000, $250,000 a year regularly and consistently telling you that that is the path that you should take. And you've never done this. Listen, believe them. Um, in many ways, this is a counterintuitive business, uh, especially if you've come from other sales backgrounds. I see a lot of people who have been in other sales before, non-insurance sales, um, but some insurance sales also, uh, who have a really hard time adjusting to the fact that this business is about the people, not the product. Um, it's about understanding how those people work and talking to them about things that are meaningful to them. Um, a lot of times people come in, they've done a lot of term life sell selling um, or they've done a lot of that kind of high level financial planning um, and want to talk to people about, you know, universal life products and guaranteed universal and all sorts of stuff that cash values and buy term and invest the difference, all sorts of crazy stuff that does not matter to our people. Um, our people send this card in because they are concerned that when they die, their kids are going to be left on the hook with a bill that they can't afford to pay. And that's the only thing that matters to 95% of them. Um, talking to them about that in a way that makes sense to them and in a way that builds their trust in you, um, that's, that's everything. Uh, and that's hard for a lot of guys. Um, so. The easiest thing to do is find a mentor, pick a path, follow that path. Yeah, no, I, I find I find that the biggest competition in this business is really just yourself mm -hmm. and your own uh, self doubts. It's it's, yeah. it's sales is such an interesting business. I'm sure you've seen the difference. Now you come from the teaching profession into this, and and it isn't hard work. I mean, there's a lot harder work out there, but it's, it's psychological warfare, I guess, in a sense. And, and it's hard to see that from the outside in. Yeah. It's, um, and it is, I, the biggest obstacle is you don't have anybody but you out there. You know, it's just you and your own self doubt. And it is easy to get in your head. Um, uh, it's probably why I spend so much time doing things like posting in the Facebook forums and stuff like that. It's just good to talk to other people that do this. Uh, and there's nobody else that's really going to understand final expense other than final expense agents. It's its own beast. Um, right. So, yeah, no, it's it, it is good. It's good. It's it's good to have the support because and the other thing too in this business is I kind of think of it as maybe the one downside is that most agents are completely alone. They don't have an office to go to. Mm -hmm. They don't have a manager to talk to. And trust me, there's things about that that are good that we don't have to deal with that. However, you know, camaraderie is the thing that's missing, I think, from a lot of agents. And, and it's just, it's good to talk to people who are doing this successfully to remind you that they can do it, you can do it. Absolutely. And uh, to just keep you mentally, you know, on, on the right course. So, um, yeah, last question. We kind of hit this, but I'm kind of curious. I always ask this of everybody uh, I yeah. talk to. Um, where do you see this business in 20 years? Do you see it exactly the same? You know, we got the 30 and 40-year-olds now, Gen X, maybe a few millennials even. Uh, they start hitting the 50s, 60s, and 70s. I mean, are they going to apply to direct mail? Or are they going to be the same kind of people that we're seeing now? What, what, what do you think we're, we're going towards here in the next couple of decades? I, I think so, actually. I think there is a lot of stuff that goes on with our people that is very cultural. Um, there is a culture of these are people that buy final expense policies, you know? And I will sit down and I will talk to people who are 70 years old now, and they have stories about, you know, the New York Life agent coming by and collecting debit debit checks from their parents every week when they were kids and their grandparents, you know, did the same. And, um, now they're, you know, buying a final expense policy for, to make sure their grandkids are taken care of and they want to make sure their kids get in front of and talk to somebody soon too. And, um, and, and that kind of goes back to a little bit what I said, you know, certain areas have kind of a, have their own personality. Um, and certain types of people have their own personality. Final expense people are not like 
upper middle class people. Um, it is a different thing um, with different expectations and a different background. Frankly, they they come from a different place where this is just what it is. Um, I will talk to lots and lots and lots of people who want their kids there um, when they're making this decision. I never have a problem with that um, because most of the time their kids are fully on board with the idea of their parents buying a final expense policy. And you know what? Those kids, maybe they're 30, maybe they're 40 now. When they're 60 and 70 years old, they're going to want to buy a final expense policy too. Um, there may be some minor differences. You know, like I said, people are texting me now. Maybe Facebook becomes a larger part of things, but the reality is they're going to be still filling out lead return cards. You're still going to be setting appointments. You're still going to be going out and talking to people. I'd be very surprised if it changed dramatically. Yeah, you know, it, it's funny because um, the one thing that, like you mentioned earlier, a lot of a lot of people don't understand, and, and it took me a while to get this too. You, when you come into final expense, it, it's it's a mass market. It's a lot of people, but you don't necessarily see these people in everyday walks of life. Right. Most people don't understand how these people think and why they do what they do, and and it's really a crash course lesson and you know, really just normal people, you know, you, again, you just, I don't know if you're like me, but I, before I got into final expense, I dealt with a upper middle class market, totally different thought process, totally, totally different cultural experience. And then getting involved in this, it was a learning curve to just adapt to what these people think and do. And, and I think as uh, you know, pretty much people and their children, you know, carry on the same value systems economically, socioeconomically, mostly, uh, yeah. And so I think we'll see, like you said, exactly the same kind of people. They may be online more than they are sending direct mail off, but I don't think the basics will change. You know, I think it'll be more or less the same same types of people. It hasn't changed in in seven eight years. Same. Yeah, and it's people. you know, and, and a lot of revolutions have gone on, you know, culturally yeah. and technology. That's true. Yeah. And, you know, even since you got in the business, um, you know, it's a different world now than it was in 2011, and. Um, yeah, I mean, and I love our people. Like, I really like working with this with this client group. I think I think it's a really fun group to work with. Um, not everybody does, um, but there is something very different and distinct about them. They are, like you said, they're not the types of people you see in everyday walks of life. Um, but it's something that's important to them, and they pass that value on to their kids. Uh, so I don't see that. I don't see that burning out anytime soon. Right. Well, Nick, I want to thank you so much again for joining me today. It was a, a pleasurable experience. Uh, you uh, divulged a lot of uh, what you do and why you do it. And I think this will be extremely useful for uh, final expense agents, new and experienced. And, uh, and again, thank you so much for your time. I know you're really busy, so I appreciate you spending it with us. Thanks for having me, Dave. It was fun. All right, Nick. Well, you have a good one. And thanks, guys, for watching. Y'all take care.